I remember very well that scene on, on, December, 30, on December 23rd, 1935. We passed the, the Statue of Liberty when we came from Europe and became immigrants to the United States of America. My uh, Don Patton has asked me to talk a little bit about uh, how we got here and so forth. Uh, it, it really uh, was remarkable. My father came home on January 30th, 1933, the day that Hitler became Reich Chancellor, and he said to my mom, we're leaving Germany forever. And we left in 1933 and arrived in the United States in 1935 and passed on the Hudson River. We passed the Statue of Liberty and I re still remember my mom trying to describe it to me. I was a boy of five and very excited to be on that boat. And my family, uh, uh, many of them escaped Germany. Uh, of those who did not, of those who didn't even get as far as Great Britain or Sweden, but they stayed on the European continent, uh, one person survived. So we're lucky to be here in the United States of America, and America is indeed magnificent, and I'm going to tell you why. Uh, in August, in five days from now, it'll be the 76th anniversary of the end of World War II, when Emperor Hirohito of Japan surrendered. Uh, it's uh, been a long 76 years, but it has been an extraordinary 76 years. It's the longest period in history where there has been no war between major powers. Sure, there have been wars during this period. Uh, it's been a bumpy time, but no major power wars. Major power wars are those kinds that kill millions of people, World War I, World War II. They set the humanity behind. They impoverish and displace millions and millions of more, and they destroy the productive capacity of nations. And this 76 year period is remarkable for the length that there have been no such major power wars, but also it's remarkable because of the growth of democracy. And if you will, Mom, uh, show the, it's my wife, Ellen, we just, we, We just uh, celebrated 65 years of marriage. And yeah, that's great. The 76 years has been absolutely remarkable because of the growth of democracy. At the end of World War I, there were in the world six or seven democracies. The English-speaking nations, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, the US, Great Britain, and one or two others. And, but there wasn't much democracy in the world. After World War II, the number had grown to about a dozen nations. And, and it's interesting, the importance of democracy is exhibited by a little country called Costa Rica in middle America. In, uh, uh, and they have been a democracy for many years, right after World War II. What's democracy mean? Have, nobody in this room has heard about, about uh, Costa Ricans coming up to our border and, and seeking uh, to enter the United States. They're in Central America, but yet uh, they have a democracy. And the people want to stay where they know. People want to stay where their families are. And so the thought of, and the power of democracies is an extraordinary thing. And during the seven, 76 years, uh, we uh, have seen a remarkable growth of democracies. The Freedom House, which was started by Franklin Roosevelt's wife, Eleanor, and Wendell Wilkie, and 
Some of you guys are old enough to remember Wendell Wilkie, who ran for president in 1940. And, and uh, can we go back again to the... Uh, and and uh, you'll see how free freedom, free countries have grown in number. Partly free countries have grown somewhat, and not free countries have declined. What's the importance of, of uh, all of these free countries? Well, for one thing, there are about 100 democracies now. As you see, there are 195 members of the United Nations, and 82 are democracies, and of the 59, uh, a number of them really on the borderline and can be called democracies. But the importance of democracies is absolutely remarkable. There's never been a war between two democracies. There's never been a famine in democracies. And history is all about war and poverty and famines, but it's different in democracies. And all the present wars, see the green is a free country. The purple is the not free countries. The yellow is partly free. All of the wars, all of the problems of the world uh, are in the purple countries. All of the people who are not behaving themselves, all the dictators, that's where they are. And democracies, there's never been a war between two democracies. Hard to find an, an instance where a democracy has started a war. There's never been a famine in democracies, and democracy is absolutely essential. And one of the things that Milton Friedman, the economist who all of you know about, one of the things that he pointed out was that there has never been a democracy without free enterprise, without a free economic society. And that uh, has been of enormous importance as well. Free enterprise is the most productive economic system and it has spread so much with democracy that now, during these 76 years, that of no war, no major war, for the first time in history, fewer than half of the people are living in poverty in the world. As a matter of fact, the number is pretty close to a quarter of all the people of the world who live uh, in poverty. It has been an extraordinary period. Uh, the Economist magazine uh, in 2009 pointed out there were two billion more bourgeois, uh, middle class folks uh, in the world uh, because of the growth of free enterprise. And they said it again in 2013. They said the trend towards democracy and freedom is expanding and the biggest, and I a quote, the biggest poverty reduction measure of all is the liberalizing of markets to let poor people get rich. That free enterprise, open democracy, open economies have been the thing that have brought the world forward. So, and of course, a lot of that comes from the Far East. There was the Chinese leader, Deng Xiaoping. You may recall him in 1979. And he said, to be rich is glorious. And he began the process of allowing free enterprise and better economic institutions in China. Now we have Xi Jinping in, in China, and he is squeezing things back. His three predecessors all abided by the 10-year rule that they were, they were at the head of China for 10 years and then they retired. He has declared and created a situation where he's going to be dictator for life. And he is clamping down and clamping down. If you get the Wall Street Journal, you can read every day almost and sometimes day after day after day, how he is squeezing free enterprise. 
how he is squeezing the opportunities for individuals. It's individuals uh, that make things happen in a free society. Uh, so that, and the same thing has happened in India to a lesser extent. And this new ruler of India, Modi, is something of a disappointment, frankly. He wants to be more of a Hindu than he wants to be a leader. And he's bringing too much religion into a society that has been called free. And we don't have the map, but unfortunately, India on the Modi has gone from, from a free country. The map is not entirely current. Last year, they became a partly free country. Uh, but they have much to do. So we have 76 years, 76 years in which the gross national product of the world at the end of World War II was about $5 trillion. Today, it's about $80 trillion. It has been a long 76 years without war. It has been a long 76 years when free enterprise and freedom have prevailed, and it has been the best 76 years of human history. But uh, this talk uh, is about magnificent America. So let me tell you, and let's look at the American role in these 76 years, because there's too much misunderstanding about that today, that America has led the world to the best 76 year period in the world's history. I go all the way back to Lincoln, all the way back to the Civil War. Some people think this is the worst time. People very often think this is the worst time in history. The worst time in American history was the Civil War, when well over 600,000 young Americans were killed at the time when there were only 30 million people in our country. And you remember that uh, what Lincoln said, he said about the South, we're gonna let them down easy. We're going to incorporate them back into the United States. We're gonna let them down easy. You'll remember his second inaugural that, uh, address when he said, with malice towards none, and charity for all. But uh, six days after General Lee surrendered to General Grant on, on uh, Palm Sunday, 1865, the 9th of April, on the 15th of April, six days later, Lincoln was gone. And um, really uh, a terrible tragedy. And then came President Johnson. President Johnson, uh, as you know, was impeached. President Johnson, uh, his sympathies lay with the South and not with the American victors of the North. And so this country had a hundred years of strife. Uh, the, the blacks were free, but they weren't entirely free. Uh, they were abused. At the end of World War I, which uh, was called the, 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 the war to end all wars, it, that's what they called it, the war to end all wars, because it was so terrible. 20 million, perhaps 25 million people died in the First World War. And finally, the Germans surrendered. And while they lost a lot of men in France, the whole war was fought in France and there was no destruction to speak of in Germany and the German population didn't think they had lost the war. And then came the Versailles treaties that the French and the English put together, which was a mean spirited, punishing treaty, which was one of the main reasons for the rise of Hitler. And Lloyd George, who was the English negotiator of all of that, said he recognized what they were doing. He said, we're going to have to do this all over again 25 years from now. He missed it by only one. It was 24 years later 
that the Germans surrendered for a second time. But even before World War II ended, uh, one of history's great achievements was that Churchill and Roosevelt and later Harry S. Truman began the process of letting them down easy. All three of them had read their history. Churchill wrote that to be magnanimous in victory, all three were keenly aware of the Treaty of Versailles and the, the, the harsh portions of that treaty. The lessons of history had been learned. And step number one for magnificent America was the conference at Bretton Woods. The conference at Bretton Woods, the old, that's the old hotel there. And of course, you see also uh, Churchill and Roosevelt and down there Stalin. And uh, the Russians didn't uh, participate in uh, the Bretton Woods, but they did three things. Can you go back one month? And uh, first, it established the monetary system that all trade in the world should be measured by one, one currency, and that was the dollar. And then secondly, uh, they uh, said they created, I should say, the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs which today is called the World Trade Organization, in order to uh, lower the barriers, the tariffs, the, the, the barriers to world trade, which happened in the period up to the world before, after the First World War and before the Second World War, many barriers to trade were created and they decided at, at Bretton Woods were going to do away with them. And that was a historic. And finally, it created the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, for those countries that was ha were having a hard time that they could make loans and so forth. It was a unique step that occurred in the spring of 1944, before uh, D-Day, uh, before uh, the, the end of the war, war, of course, it was a year and almost a half before the end of the war that they established the economic platform that would exist at the end of the war. That was step one by Magnificent America. Step two, something that you're very familiar with, and that is the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan uh, was unique in history. No other country had ever rebuilt its, its adversaries as well as its friends. The United States spent, in today's terms, $800 billion uh, restoring uh, 17 countries' economy and setting the tone for the uh, period between World War II and today. It was absolutely an unprecedented, unique thing in history that the winning power rebuilt its enemies, Japan, and we rebuilt Germany as well, and, and did for the world what we did with the Marshall Plan. Churchill called it one of history's most unselfish acts. Again, we rebuilt 17 nations, and uh, the Marshall Plan had a free market component. And so Stalin wanted no part of it. And Stalin acted the way that victors always had acted. He stripped the countries that he now occupied in Eastern Europe, he stripped them of everything that was worth having and took it back to Russia. We instead rebuilt. Uh, the country's friends and foes alike. And now comes step three. The U.S., having done all that, then did the least mentioned, the least recognized, the least appreciated, the most expensive, and the most significant of all magnificent America's uh, contribution in the World War II area, and that is we provided 
a defense umbrella that continues to this day. And uh, there's the umbrella, there are the Americans, and it continues uh, to this day. Where there have been American boots on the ground, there has not been war in the period of the 76 years. And now today you see that we're taking two and a half thousand troops out of Afghanistan, and Afghanistan is just collapsing as they leave. Two and a half thousand American troops in Afghanistan were sufficient to keep the peace. That is the strength of America. That is how much America is both appreciated and feared by people like the, the Taliban. That two and a half thousand people can, can uh, keep the peace in a country twice the size of Minnesota. Uh, and the idea of that defense umbrella was the most significant thing of providing the world with a defense umbrella that continues to this day. We're still in Europe, we're still in Japan, we're still in the Philippines, we're still in Korea, uh, and uh, it, it, the world is a better place because of it. And what, what did it do? It allowed the world to develop their economies without the overhead of building armies to protect themselves against one another. Uh, under the umbrella, old enemies, particularly France and Germany, became friends. And they did become friends because they could. Uh, when I arrived in Washington uh, in November of 1978, we had half a million troops around the world. Uh, most of them, 350,000, were in Europe, 150,000 were in Asia. Today, that number is after the fall of, of communism. The number has gone down significantly, but it's still important and it's still keeping the peace. And, and what the United States has done in creating and maintaining a world uh, uh, defense umbrella uh, has been extraordinarily important in the success of the world in these 76 years. Democracy was born, free enterprise was born, and the world became a better place. Even though you read the morning paper or look at the news, they may say the end is near. It's not the case because magnificent America has created a broad number of democracies around the world and free enterprise uh, prevails there. Michael Mandelbaum in his book, The Case for Goliath, the case the U.S. being Goliath, maintains that the United States has successfully acted as the world's government since World War II. And I quote, without the American role in providing a secure political framework for trade and investment, a currency for all global transactions, a large market for foreign products, the United States uh, as, a, as a single power lowered its tariff barriers, and the world has largely followed, not entirely by any means, but we have led the way. So, and that we would make loans for countries in acute financial stress, the economic prospects of other countries would suffer, and their government knew it, even, in, though, even though they didn't say very often that it was so. And on page 134, Mandelbaum says the achievement for the first time in history of sustained economic growth is one of the hallmarks of the, mo of the modern age. And in this 76 years, it's been bumpy, the growth of the economy, but it's been bumpy, but always trending upwards. And so that good things have happened. Lee Kuan Yew, who you may recall, was really the founder and builder of Singapore, a, a nation that is less than half of the size of Hennepin County, but has as many people as the whole state of Minnesota. And, and uh, he built that into a free country, not entirely free, but largely free, 
and showed what freedom does. And he said, America is great, not only because of its power and wealth, but after World War II, its magnanimity and generosity helped to build and rebuild a more prosperous world. Only the elevated power of the U.S. idealism can explain this. The United States is the most benign of all the great powers. What's he mean, most benign? He means that we didn't want anybody's territory. We weren't asking for uh, the other country to do very much for us. We just wanted peace and free enterprise and freedom. And we got just a lot of it in this post-World War II period. So the conclusion is that the world is a better place largely because of the influence, strength, and action of the United States of America. Letting them down easy, the Marshall Plan that rebuilt Europe and the Far East, a costly U.S. defense umbrella for the free world, leading to 76 years of no major war that in turn led to the growth of democracy and free enterprise in the first ever period of sustained economic growth, causing an extraordinary reduction in poverty. It couldn't, it wouldn't have happened without magnificent America. It didn't happen by leading from behind something that you will recall President Obama spoke about. Uh, it, it happened because of a, a robust foreign policy. I mean, uh, Reagan, and I was there through all eight of the Reagan years, uh, he led a robust foreign policy. He called out the Russians, he said in 1982, that the Russians are on the edge of the dustbin of history, you may recall of it. He called them an evil empire. He called them to tear down this wall. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Those were the kind of robust foreign policies that, that uh, were indicated and that showed what Reagan was up to. And, and it's not even clear what leading from behind meant. It may have meant that uh, uh, the heavy listing is, uh, should be done by other people. And our allies were not particularly good heavy lifters. Uh, but during my Senate years, the world had three leaders that together ended the Cold War. I expected to live with Russian communism for my whole entire life. I didn't think that the communism would collapse. Ronald Reagan knew. Ronald Reagan knew that a country that was not free, that did not allow its people to achieve what they could, with free markets, uh, he understood that a country that didn't allow those things, the communist country, which China is becoming more and more all the time, is no competition for a free society. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, Pope John Paul II, and Reagan, the world was lucky that they all happened to come in the 1980s and they created the end of communism, brought down com communism, and uh, that 
was one of the really remarkable steps forward uh, in our life, all of our lifetime. So, lots of things are good, but threats really do remain. You have to know about the threats just as you know about the good things. Uh, there are the jihadists, but they kill mostly their own people, very frankly, and are more a threat to them than in the Middle East, uh, the real mess. And, but there are some hopeful signs, even in the Middle East. And one is not very current, but one is six, eight years old, that 22 million Egyptians demonstrated against the Muslim Brotherhood when they were ruling Egypt. It was the largest popular uprising in history, 22 million people. And they didn't want to have an Iranian-style theocracy. Uh, it was the biggest mass dem demonstration in history. So that, that was the fact that uh, a Sunni nation, a leading nation of the Middle East, says we don't want to have a theocratic government like Iran is extremely important. Hopeful sign number two, uh, Dennis, Dennis Ross. Dennis Ross, who was a friend, and he was for Bush and for for Clinton for eight years, he was the principal Middle East negotiator, told me about a poll that when the Palestinians were asked what kind of a government they wanted, their first choice, 78% said, like Israel's, an open society, a free society. Hopeful sign number three is that when they were allowed to vote, the people, it looks like Afghanis are not going to be allowed to vote again, but when they could, and when the Iraqis could, they voted in numbers like as if they were Minnesota. In Minnesota, North and South Dakota, the largest percentage of uh, eligible voters vote of any other states in the country. And it's the 73, 74 percent. And so it was in Iraq, and so it was in Afghanistan, even though people threatened, if you vote, we're going to kill you. But they still went out and voted, so that's a positive sign. But uh, many things uh, happened in the Middle East, and uh, democracy has had a hard time coming to the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East is still the area of the greatest number of people who can't read. Uh, that that uh, uh, the, one of their problems is uh, education and the fact that uh, 65 million adults are still illiterate in the Middle East, all of which is illustrated by this interesting fact that every year, every year, more books are translated into Spanish than have been translated into Arabic in the last thousand years. More books in one year are translated into Spanish than have been translated into Arabic all across history, really, a thousand years. But if terrorists, the jihadists, get hold of or are allowed to develop nuclear weapons, uh, they could and would become a world-class threat. An electronic uh, civilization like ours can be subjected to cyber attacks, and all of you have an awareness of, of that. <coughs> that cyber attack can be directed at the electric grid in the United States. It's called an EMP, electromagnetic pulse, which can be created with a nuclear weapon at a very high altitude, 50, 60 miles altitude, and create a surge of voltage that, that brings down the electric grid of a country. We have to be very, very careful about that, and we have to prepare for that, and the government, our government, has not been as good at all in preparing for such an attack. Uh, and, and it's not very difficult to prepare for the, such an attack. 
But the conclusion, the conclusion is that, yes, there's a lot to do. We always face challenges. If it's not one challenge, it's, it's another challenge. But magnificent America has, in the last 76 years, undertaken that responsibility. And uh, it's important that America continue to lead the world. And with American leadership, we will have, again, a good 76 years, and perhaps then it becomes a little more permanent. The exact the actions of magnificent America in the last 76 years have been unprecedented in history, absolutely unprecedented in history. The United States has brought uh, about a better place in the world, and they made the world a better place. They are the most positive influence that exists in the world, and you and I, I as an immigrant, you as Americans, and perhaps there are some immigrants, we should be proud because America is really magnificent. Thank you.